proceed. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Barb. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will continue to join. Um, my name is Trisha Wagner, and I am the um, a grant writer and program development coordinator here at ECIA. And I am going to, we're, we're doing this a little differently today. Our, all of our conference rooms were booked with large group meetings. So we're doing this out of my office. So we're going, I will be letting uh, Pat come over and have a seat here in front of the, the screen in just a moment. I would like to, um, before I introduce him to a couple of housekeeping things as usual, um, we will be um, asking if you have questions just to put them in the chat and we will cover those at the end of the presentation or feel free at the end of the presentation just to unmute yourself and ask the question too. That sounds better, that, that would be great. Um, so I, I will, without further ado, go ahead and introduce uh, Pat. He has been kind enough to come and do this training for us. The training is being funded through the USDA um, with a grant that we've received for Rural Community Development Initiative. And um, the, the, the training will focus today again on best practices for mayors and city council members to manage their, their councils effectively. And Pat has served as a city manager for Maquoketa, Iowa from 1978 to 1993 as a, and as a city administrator for Anamosa, Iowa from 2006 to 2010. He has also served as a consultant to cities for the uh, Institute of Public Affairs at the University of Iowa from 1993 to 2005. He worked as a municipal consultant for Snyder and Associates from 2010 to 2013. He established Callahan Municipal Consultants, LLC, in 2013 and provides numerous consulting services to cities. He has a bachelor's degree in political science from Loris College and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Iowa. So I'd like to welcome Pat and you can come on over here and have a seat. I will get out of your way. Oh yes, I will share the slideshow. One moment, you're gonna want that. Go. Oh, good. And we need to see the people. And then how do you write the Just slide that, just scroll through, just like the preamble. Just like that. Yep. And we can see. All oh, right. That's good. Okay. Well, thank you, Tricia. So, as you can see, this topic is uh, the 10 habits of highly effective city councils. And um, we, uh, this will go till 1.30, but I'm not sure if we'll need all that much time. Uh, my guess is we'll have a most of it wrapped up by uh, one o'clock or a little after that. So, but, uh, but we have allocated at least to 1.30 on the Zoom. So that, uh, that works well. Let me tell you a little bit about how this workshop came to be. Uh, probably 25 years ago, I was reading an article uh, that talked about what city councils um, can do to become more effective. And as you might guess, the, the title of the article was the 10 habits of highly effective city councils. But uh, it was about 15 pages long, and it went into a lot of detail. And I thought, you know, I, I'm going to have a very difficult time getting the mayors and councils I'm working with to take the time to read that entire article. So what I did was I just kind of took it and paraphrased it into a page and a half and, uh, and used it many times when I did my goal setting sessions for city councils and would give it to them at the end of the uh, sessions. Well, and recently someone said to me, you know, you've been in city government for a long time. It's actually 48 years that I've been doing this, uh, 23 years as a city manager in various cities, um, and then 24 years as a municipal consultant. And um, I was asked, as you look back over your career, what is it that some cities have done that makes them so successful in the world? You know, cities that kind of come to my mind, uh, well, I know we got somebody watching from Charles City, and uh, I, I look upon that city as one of the more successful cities out there. Um, Manchester comes to mind, uh, Dyersville, you know, and uh, as I looked at those, I thought, hey, what did those cities do uh, to make them so successful? Then on the other side of the equation, uh, I can tell you that more than once, I have watched cities struggle. Uh, I've watched them fight with each other. And I've watched them not get a whole lot accomplished. And it just seems like they, uh, they go from one crisis to the next and they 
go from putting out one fire to the next and nothing really important or, or really great gets done in the community other than, uh, you know, just uh, the day-to-day -day operations. And so as I compared those types of cities, I thought, what did they do differently? And I've also observed over the years that there's been a, some cities kind of have this cycle, you know, uh, they might have some successes and then there's some failures and then there's issues and it's kind of up and down, up and down. And uh, I've watched those kind of cities over the years. Um, my question to you folks are, would be, where do you fit? <laughs> where does your city fit as you look over the history? Let's say the history of the last 20 years in your community. Where would you put your city in what category? The ones that have been very, very successful, ones that have really struggled and fought with each other and got not a whole lot done. Or maybe you're one of those few cities that's got these cycles, you know, you do some good things and then, you know, things kind of fall apart and then you have your failures. So kind of think to yourself as you go, you listen to this presentation is where does my city fit and where do they fit today, you know, in terms of how we get things done. Now, the other thing I want to make very clear to you is that not every successful city has done all of these things that I'm going to talk about. There's probably no one city out there uh, that has done all 10 things. The possible exception might be some of the larger communities out there that have the staff to pursue a lot of this stuff. Uh, they might. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the city of Dubuque would look at my 10 habits and say, yeah, we've done all that stuff. Or maybe, you know, I'm going to do goal setting uh, in two weeks in Coralville. You know, they may have done all these things. So now the other thing I want to make clear is that uh, that uh, even though you do some of these things, you may still struggle from time to time. OK, so it, it's not a it, it's not a one fits all type thing. A good general rule would be in my mind is if you adopt some of these habits, the probability that your city and, and your council will be successful. I think will increase if you adopt some, if not all of these habits. And so the other thing is, um, is your job might be more enjoyable, okay? Because if you're one of those council members or mayors or city clerks that absolutely dreads that regular council meeting, that Monday or Tuesday council meeting, and you think, oh man, I got another council meeting. I can't wait to get this over with. If you're one of those cities, I'm hoping that you, if you adopt some of these things, that your job will be a little bit more enjoyable and maybe a little less stressful than maybe what it's been in the past. The other thing I will challenge you with, and that is I, I like to ask councils this question, okay? Council members, elected officials, what do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered? As at 10, 15 years from now, as uh, next generation takes over as being a council member or the next generation looks at this point in history, what will they say? How will they be remembered? Um, and uh, I'm getting old enough now in my, in my career and I've lost a lot of friends. I've lost a lot of relatives. Uh, I think in my last presentation, I talked about the fact that Bob Jostin just passed away. So I probably think more about this than those of you who are in their 30s and 40s because you're not losing a lot of your friends and relatives and classmates, but I am. And so it makes me ponder from time to time saying, what is my legacy going to be? Um, what are they going to put in, in your obituary? I guess is another way to put at it. But it is, what's, what will they say in that obituary? Or what will they say at your uh, their funeral or, uh, or your wake service? So, but how do you want to be remembered? Okay. I ran across a couple interesting quotes that I think uh, kind of pertain to this subject. Uh, the one I ran across was uh, a gentleman who actually wrote the book, Alice in Wonderland. And he says, if you don't know where you want to go, any road will get you there. So you need a roadmap. And another one that uh, I ran across, and I don't, I don't know the author for sure, but I think it was a gentleman that I used to listen to years and years ago on WMT 600 radio, um, uh, Earl Nightingale was his name. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this is where it came from, but it says, if you don't want, know what you want to be, then you'll have no control over what you will end up becoming. So I thought these two quotes were quite interesting uh, to start a presentation like this. Now I'm gonna go through 
these are what I call my 10 habits. And I'll spend maybe five, maybe 10 minutes on each one. Um, along the way, if you uh, want to, feel free to, you know, in the chat room, maybe put a comment, hey, our city has done that and uh, we're glad we did, or we're working on it right now, or we find this uh, I idea or suggestion uh, worthwhile. And so uh, if you uh, if you could say, you know, for example, you might say, well, at Epworth, we, uh, we've already adopted a, a mission statement, or maybe in, uh, I know we got uh, Burt, Iowa watching, and you might say, well, here in Burt, uh, we're working on that right now. So that, that kind of thing, it would be kind of interesting. Uh, I'm gonna give you names of cities uh, as examples that have done some of this. And, uh, and, and where I got a lot of these names was, I did this presentation uh, last September. Now, you may have heard from some folks that were at the Iowa League of Cities Conference in Coralville uh, in September. And uh, I did this very presentation at that meeting. Now I noticed we've got a couple of people listening that are in county government. And so you gotta keep in mind when I keep saying city council, just take out the word council and put in board of supervisors or maybe one of your county boards or commissions. So the same thing and the same concept will, will apply. And, um, and you may have heard uh, if uh, those of you are with the county, you may have heard I did this presentation uh, I think back in February when uh, the I Iowa State Association of Counties had a conference, uh, no, it was actually in March, and had a conference and I did this presentation on March 10th uh, for the, a lot of, I think there was like almost 250 county officials in the room when we covered these same topics. So you may have run across a handout where you, instead of seeing city, you're gonna see county throughout it. So I flipped it and tried to make it uh, appropriate to counties uh, during that presentation. So, and once again, um, you know, I keep coming back to the, this legacy. Uh, I think by doing a lot of these habits, you will enhance your legacy and how you will be remembered as a mayor or council member or supervisor, or for that matter, as a city administrator or as a city clerk in your community. Okay, the first thing I tell people is we gotta start with the basics. We have to kind of set a foundation that uh, is then the basis for what we do into the future. And one of the things that I've seen in some of these communities do is a very brief and concise mission statement. Uh, a mission statement is probably many times only one or two sentences. And it just says to the outside world, this is what we're here for. This is what we're striving to do. And uh, there's quite a number of cities out there that have, uh, that have made an attempt to do a, a mission statement or, a, or the other thing you occasionally see is a vision statement, which is a little bit more elaborate. Uh, it might be a paragraph or two long and it just kind of provides a, just a little bit more information about what it is your city or county wants to accomplish. Uh, it, a lot of times it'll talk about providing services to uh, residents in an efficient, effective manner uh, and, and meeting the needs of the community. And so there, there's any number of different things that you can do. Now, there are some cities out there that have done this. Um, I think someone from Asbury is watching today and uh, I understand that Asbury has done this sort of thing. Uh, if I remember right, I think Dubuque also has a very, a very good uh, mission statement and vision statement. Uh, but even some smaller communities out there I've heard about uh, Way out in Western Iowa, Sibley has done this. Uh, Hiawatha in the Cedar Rapids area. Uh, Clinton, I understand, has done this. Uh, even Guttenberg uh, and Decorah uh, to the north of us have put together um, something that uh, would kind of provide the framework as to um, how your city is viewed going forward. Another thing that I've seen cities do is develop long-term uh, goals and objectives. Now, this can be done two or three different ways, okay? The first one that you're probably familiar with, and that's your comprehensive plan. Having a good comprehensive plan that looks 20 years into the future, that says, you know, this is where we're at today, but this is what we envision this community being, you know, 20 years from now. And it'll get into things like land uses and, uh, and providing services and utilities. Um, but it's usually kind of a more of a general type thing. It's usually, it doesn't get real specific 
and it just sends a, kind of a lays an overall plan for the future. Um, another thing that I've seen cities do is prepare a capital improvements plan that identifies uh, projects that need to be completed. And usually it's, it's much more detailed. It'll talk about uh, what the project is. It'll be a description of it. It'll uh, then determine how much it's gonna cost. And then it'll also say, and I think this is the key thing is, how are we gonna pay for it? It's one thing to have this long list of great projects, but if you don't know how you're gonna pay for them, um, your goals are kind of silly. And so you're just wasting your time. And so that's, that's one, of the, one of the things that cities can do to identify their goals and objectives is, is a good capital improvements plan that usually about five years in, in length. Uh, I just helped the city of Cresco, Iowa, up in Northeast Iowa help. I just helped them put together a capital improvements plan. And I usually tell people, if you, if you wanna know why you need a capital improvements plan is, I always tell people, it's so the council doesn't try to spend the same dollar twice. Okay, because there's usually a long list of projects and a very short list of ways to pay for them. So it's a good way to make sure that you don't overextend your city and get your city in financial problem. Now, the next thing that a city can do for long range goals and objectives is a goal setting session. And that is where you identify all the things that you think your city wants to be doing in the next one to two years. And these are usually broken down into two categories. The first category is programs, policies, initiatives, things that are not bricks and mortar. Things are usually not gonna cost you a lot of money uh, where you then identify uh, what it is your, your staff is gonna be working on, uh, some of the things you're gonna be discussing at a future council meeting. And then what I like to do is list all of those things and then take the council through a ranking process where you prioritize them because many of these items take a lot of time and effort and you need to put them in a ranked order so that you get your goals and objectives accomplished in a, in a, a good methodical way. Now, the other thing I tell people is that if you don't have a capital improvements plan, then the very least thing you need to do is during your goal setting session is to list all of your capital projects and all of your major equipment purchases and then do the same thing put them in order and rank them so that you can then determine which one of these are the most important and which one of these are we going to do the most, uh, the, mo the, mo the fastest. So um, the other thing that I um, actually did, we did a workshop on this uh, uh, last month uh, and that is a good city council member orientation session. So if you did not see that presentation, uh, I would recommend that um, you take a look at it particularly if like, if you have a new council member just coming on the scene that uh, has, knows little or nothing about city government. Uh, an ideal time to pull this presentation out and look at it again will be a year from this fall because in November of 2023, we will have city elections again. And for those of you in county government, obviously we'll have county government elections this fall. So the ideal time for you folks to look at this presentation would be sometime in November, December of this year. But for those of you in, in city government, probably isn't real urgent that you look at this presentation right now. Unless of course, you're one of those councils out there where maybe you've got three or four brand new council members that just came on the scene on January 1st, and you're kind of struggling to get an idea of what is this job all about that I just took on, that of being a mayor or a council member. And that orientation session workshop uh, might be useful to you to look at. So now there's quite a number of cities out there that have really uh, taken to heart this last one on doing a good orientation session. Um, for example, I, I've heard Clinton does a very good uh, orientation session. I know Hiawatha does uh, and Muscatine. So uh, if, you, um, if you have an interest in that, you might check with some of those uh, cities and see what their orientation looked like. Um, and I believe the, the um, when I did the orientation workshop, I, uh, I provided some supplemental handouts, which by the way, uh, as part of this workshop, I provided so, what I call supplemental handouts as well. So if you haven't had a chance to download those uh, additional handouts, uh, feel free to do, uh, do so. 
And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those handouts so you know uh, why I put it in kind of a packet for you to uh, look at during this presentation. But the bottom line is, <laughs> if you have a mission statement, a vision statement, and you have good goals and objectives, boy, you have covered the basics and you're off to a good start. Habit number two, having a good understanding of the elements of teamwork. And what I mean by that is that the city council and the board of supervisors is a collection of very diverse people who come from various backgrounds. Uh, there may be a huge difference in age, you know. Uh, there may be a huge difference in, uh, you know, uh, income levels or, uh, you know, their, their job responsibilities or, you know, it could be a, a good mix of retired people and could be a group of people that, uh, you know, are just starting their careers. So there's a there's a huge diverse group of people that now have come together <laughs> as one, a council or a board, and it's their job to oversee city government in their community. So now one of the hardest things that people have a, have a hard time understanding when they come into city government is that the only power that a city council has is when you act as one entity, one council member by themselves has absolutely no power unless given to them possibly by people who cave in to maybe what they asked for. So the only real power rests with the city council in Iowa when they come in session and they have legally posted an agenda and followed all of the open meetings law, which by the way, uh, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Keep in mind, it's very important for you to follow that open meetings law because if you don't, and you make some kind of decision, you take some action, it can be invalidated. It can be thrown out. A court could say that was not done in a proper council meeting. And so whatever action that was, anyone that's disgruntled with it can throw it out. And so it's critical that you understand and accept that concept that the only power that a council has is in a properly posted and, and legal uh, council meeting. The other thing is important for people to understand is that uh, you need to come together to accomplish a specific purpose or a specific goal. And if you don't understand that concept and you're kind of like the Lone Ranger out there, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot accomplished. You're probably not going to get some of the things done that you thought you would when you assumed the office of city council member or you assumed the office uh, of mayor. The other thing that's important for you to, to keep in mind is, is that it's so critical that you have a good working relationship with everyone else on that council. And that only happens when there's mutual trust and there's openness and there's mutual respect. If any one of those three items is missing, if there's a lack of trust, if there is not openness, and if there's not mutual respect, your job as a council member or as a mayor is going to be extremely difficult. And uh, it's not going to be enjoyable. And so it, it's important that you, that all of the council members understand this, this last key here, because if, it, if it's not there, you're not gonna enjoy being a council member. And uh, they're gonna be one of those folks out there that says, I'm not running again. I don't know why I did this in the first place. And I hope you're not one of those, but, but the bottom line is, it's, it's you have to support uh, the majority and you have to come together and respect each other. I always tell people, whenever a council comes together and they um, they make a decision, and let's say it's a split vote. Let's say it's, if you have a five member council and it's three, two or four, one, then somebody was on the losing side. You know, somebody didn't get what they want. Now, as a council member who is on the losing side on something, there's two ways for you to handle that because you might be confronted by someone in the supermarket or on the street who says, boy, I just saw where the council of the board made this decision. Uh, I see that you, uh, you voted against that. Boy, I'll bet you're upset. Now, how do you respond to that person? There's two ways you can respond to that person. Okay. The first way you have, you can respond by saying, yeah, I can't believe what the council did. That was the dumbest decision they ever made. Uh, I don't, I don't know what the heck they were thinking, you know, stupid decision. 
what have you just done? You have now portrayed your counsel as people don't know what they're doing. You portrayed them as being stupid. The other way to handle that exact same question from a constituent would be, yes, the council made that decision. We had a good thorough discussion. We looked at the pros and cons of that decision and the way this country works, majority rules. And so the council majority made that decision. I voted the other way because I had a different perspective, but I support the majority of the council because that's how this country works. We support the majority's decision and we move forward. I may someday be in the majority on another issue and some of the council members that voted against it may now be in the minority. I would hope that when that happens, they will so show the same level of trust and mutual respect for me as I am now showing for them. Now, what image have you now presented to that constituent versus the image that you would have shown to him if you threw your fellow council members under the bus, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind because what I find is, is that sometimes what happens outside the council meeting is just as important as what happens in the council meeting and how it is talked about to the public and how it is presented to the public. So you need to keep in mind that if you have any hope whatsoever of having trust and mutual respect is that it has to not only be in the meeting, it has to be outside the meeting as well. Okay, small group discussion making is habit number three. And this can be a struggle for some people. Um, you know, the ability to work with others. In order to make good decisions in a small group, and most councils are, you know, five, six, maybe seven. Uh, a lot of boards and supervisors are only three people. Uh, some boards, like in Jones County, where I'm at, it's a five member board. And so it's it is basically the dynamics of small group discussion making and making a decision with small groups. So you gotta have that ability to work well with others, okay? You also have to have the knowledge to do the job. And so it's so important that when you assume the role of a county supervisor or a city council member, that you really dig into understanding what that job is, what it entails, what you have now just taken on. It also requires the ability to deal with issues rationally, okay? Because sometimes I've seen discussions take place at council meetings that are totally irrational and they get off on tangents that maybe has nothing to do with the topic at hand. And so it's, it's, it's critical that you have the ability to deal with issues on a rational ba basis. And the other thing is, um, is to remember the dignity of the office, as I call it. Because as an elected council member, as an elected mayor, elected board of supervisors member, you have assumed an awesome responsibility because you have taken on the responsibility of setting the direction for your community. And uh, you will have the responsibility of overseeing all the infrastructure in your community, the streets, the water, the sewer, all those buildings. And I tell people it's your job to take that infrastructure and pass it on to the next generation as in good a condition as you inherited it and hopefully passed on that infrastructure in a better condition than what you inherited. Because if you pass that infrastructure on to the next generation in worse condition, now you've made the diff you have made it very difficult for that next city council, that next generation of leaders to take that and keep the infrastructure in place and keep it up to date. So it's a huge responsibility that you've assumed. Now, in order to master good small group discussions, as I said before, you better know that open meetings law, okay? You better have a good understanding of it. And you also have better have a good understanding of any court cases that have impacted the, uh, the open meetings law. I was just talking to someone from Warren County uh, not too long ago, and, and the person said, you might remember Warren County. And I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, you were the county that resulted in the Iowa Supreme Court decision that said, hey, folks, you cannot have a walking quorum. And uh, by a walking quorum, that is, 
where you have somebody polling the council and they're not in a meeting. <laughs> they're at their at their desk and they're sending out emails or they're making phone calls saying, how are you going to vote on this? Would you support this if we put it on the next agenda? You cannot do that. OK, that is a violation of the open meetings law. Another good thing to have is a good set of bylaws uh, and or what I call meeting procedures that clearly define how your discussions are going to take place and how the meetings are going to uh, to take place. But what we're trying to get to at this point is, is you have a very professional approach to decision making and that you remain professional throughout the discussions. And hopefully you don't lose your temper because I can tell you once the tempers start to flare, uh, the results of your decision making process is going to go down real fast. And so uh, the idea is, is to once again, like the old slide said before, respectful and patient with each other and have, uh, you know, rational decisions. And um, the other thing is that, um, is that during the discussions, don't be making promises that you can't keep, okay? Because one of the worst things you can do, uh, and, and outside the office too, is making promises to your constituents or your taxpayers and then finding out later, gee, I don't have the power to do that. Or I can't convince my fellow council members to do that. So it's very important uh, that you be careful on what promises you make uh, during these discussions, okay? Okay, habit number four. Now, this is something that really needs to be discussed in the orientation section too that I talked about. And that is clearly defining the, role, role, the roles of everyone involved and the relationship and how it all fits together. And now, the Iowa League of Cities puts out a great publication called the Municipal Policy Leaders Handbook. And um, I think about 25 years ago, uh, Tim Shields and I, we worked together at the Institute of Public Affairs and Tim's, Tim, Tim had a, an idea of taking that handbook that used to be written by the Institute and updating it to a much more elaborate and, and um, more comprehensive document. And so one of the tasks that he gave me at the time was to see if we could expand that policy leader's handbook, which we did, and turned it into a kind of a thick three ring binder. Well, unfortunately, the Institute is no longer there. It's been dissolved and done away with, but the Iowa League of Cities, has taken on that role and they put out this municipal policy leader handbook. That is your job description. <laughs> it's clearly laid out in the handbook what it is you're supposed to be doing as a mayor and council member. So if you have not read that municipal policy leader handbook, now's the time to get it out and now's the time to read it. I tell council members and mayors, I, if I were you, before I'd ever take office, I would sit down with that handbook and read it from cover to cover before I ever assume the role of a council member. And if, you, if you're a council member that's been there for many years and you've never read the handbook, make it a goal to sit down and read that handbook from cover to cover. Now, I don't expect you're gonna read it in one night, okay? But if you say, my goal is to read a chapter per night, maybe for the next two or three weeks, eventually you will read all the chapters and eventually you'll have that big picture. So do take time to read that handbook. One of the things that's going to talk about in that handbook is knowing everyone's responsibilities and everyone's function and how it all fits together, how the staff works and what their roles and responsibilities are. Now with the staff, it's going to be a little different in that they've got a job description. At least I hope they got a job description when they got hired. Someone should have handed them a job description and says, this is what we're hiring you to do. Now, if your city does not have job descriptions, I would urge you to do that so that everybody understands what their role is and what their relationship with, is with everyone else within the organization. So once you know all of those functions and you know everyone's responsibilities, there will now be an expected perform performance. There's a certain behavior that we will now expect from the person in that role. And so this is a critical part of making good decisions and moving forward is we're all part of a team. And each person has a distinct role and responsibility in the team. The city staff, city manager, city clerk, finance director, public works director, police chief, fire chief, they all have a role and they all have an expected level of performance that we're looking to them to do. And same thing with mayor and council and elected officials. 
you have now assumed this responsibility for making decisions. This is your role in this organization. For example, council members, it's not your role to go out and tell the guy driving the snowplow that they got to get this street first and then this and then this, or you got to plow it a certain way. That is not your role. Your role is to make sure that that person driving the snowplow is doing it in a safe manner and, and has the equipment to do it. It's the public works director or the street supervisor's role to oversee that person driving that snowplow to make sure that you know, they're following all the, the right procedures and rules and, and traffic procedures and all that. So do keep that in mind that we all have our roles in this organization. Now, it's interesting that there are some cities out there that occasionally have a council member that is really, really difficult to, be, to deal with. Now, I know that's hard for some of you to envision what, what that would be like, but there are council members that, uh, the, the term I use, I don't use it in public meetings, but the term I use is the renegade, okay? That makes life really difficult for everybody. Hopefully you don't have anyone in your council like that, um, but, there are some cities that have had the foresight to look ahead to the future and say, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a city council code of conduct that would say to the person who's just assumed the role of council member or mayor, this is the expectation that we have going forward. And some of the cities that have done this, uh, not too far away, Asbury, uh, Asbury's put together, I think, a great um, and um, I, I would urge you to read that one. Now, other cities I've heard have done this is Central City, uh, Sac City. Uh, I've heard Fairfield has done it. Uh, I've heard Avoca has done it. And so, um, and I actually um, wrote an article for the League of Cities, the Cityscape Magazine, on this very topic. I think the uh, I think the title that they put to it was "What's in Your Code of Conduct?" Okay, and I tell councils that the best time to review and write and adopt a code of conduct is when there's no problems. There's no issues where someone would say, everything's going great. Why do we even need this? Now is the time to do it, okay? The, t the time not to do it probably is when you have one or two really difficult people that you're dealing with and you're probably writing the code just for them because you're trying to corral them and get them to act more civil, act more respectful. And how do you think they're gonna react when you tell them we're gonna have a code of conduct? Well, more than likely they're gonna say, no, we're not. And it's probably going to uh, pass on a split vote. This is one of those things that you would hope would be on a unanimous vote to have a code of conduct. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that the, uh, if you have a city administrator or you have a city manager, they are required to adhere to something called the ICMA code of conduct. That's the International City Management Association uh, code of conduct. It's a national organization. There's also a state association of city managers too, and they have a code of conduct very similar to the international one. But to remain a manager or city administrator in good standing, they have to be aware of that code of conduct and follow it. And uh, if they don't follow that code of conduct, they risk the possibility of being censored and having their career seriously damaged or their career seriously ruin ruined. So it's very critical that uh, when you hire or recruit a city administrator, city manager, that you say to them, we want you to follow the ICMA code of conduct. And you could also apply that same code of conduct to uh, other staff members as well. And if I remember right, I think the, uh, the uh, city clerks in Iowa um, have a kind of a code of conduct as well. Now, the biggest challenge with this last topic in the code of conduct for council members is enforcement. So what? let's say you adopt a code of conduct and let's fast forward four years. And now a new council member comes on the scene and says, I'm not gonna follow that code. I'll do as I please. And they then become a really difficult person to deal with in council meetings and, um, and do not present the best image for your community. Well, there's not a whole lot you can do other than censor them. You could publicly censor them. 
very unlikely that you're going to remove them from the council. Uh, it's extremely difficult in the state of Iowa to remove someone from the council just because they're being a jerk. Now, they have to commit a felony in order for you to get rid of them, basically. And if they don't commit a felony and if they're just being an outright jerk at a council meeting, that's not going to get them off the council. So you're going to have to be stuck with them. But the public censor, what that censorship does, it says to your citizens, we do not approve the conduct of this individual. This individual does not reflect back the, the, the values that we hold as a council. It does not meet the standards that we have set in our vision statement and our mission statement. So therefore, folks going forward, keep that in mind. Also, voters keep this in forward because if this person runs again for office, keep in mind they were publicly censored by us because of their conduct and their behavior. Now, then it'll be up to voters as to whether or not to kick them out of office and put somebody else in there that's willing to adhere to a code of conduct. Okay, number five, establish and abide by a good city council staff partnership. This is a team effort. <laughs> One part of the team, your elected officials. The other part of the team are all of your appointed officials. And it's very important that everyone understands that the two are kind of separate, okay? You have the council on one hand that establishes the vision, establishes the goals, uh, the, adopts the policies, and then empowers your staff to get the job done, to meet the needs of the community. So, and that's up to the council then to define what the needs are that are going to be met and what the outcomes are that are going to be achieved. So it's very important that the council presents the big picture. And it was where we're going, what we're trying to do, uh, what we hope the end result will look like, okay? It's up then to your city staff to carry out these directives, to complete the task, you know, to provide the services to the public. It's up to your public works director to make sure that the streets get plowed, that the potholes get fixed, that the stop signs are in good shape. It's up to that water and sewer superintendent to make sure that you have a good supply of water and that you meet the uh, EPA and the DNR requirements on wastewater treatment. So it's up to the staff to carry that stuff all out. Mayor and council, your role is not to get into the, to the trenches, okay? Your job is to provide that big picture and provide that guidance to them so that the staff knows what the expectations are. Now, for all this to work, the key part of all this, again, is that trust <laughs> that has to be between the two, good communication between them, and, and then the regular evaluation. And so it also requires no micromanaging. You know, I use that example of the, the guy driving the snowplow. Council members, that's not your role to tell <laughs> what streets to do first. Um, so keep in mind that we, we don't do the micromanaging and that we follow what is called the chain of command and that council members and mayors do not give direct orders to individual employees. Once again, keep in mind, council members and mayors, that the only power that the council has is when the council is in session, not out of session uh, on day-to-day -day operations. If this relationship is not a good relationship, the role of council members is going to be very frustrating. And, uh, and if this partnership and role relationship is not good, you're going to have a very disgruntled city manager, city administrator, a very disgruntled city clerk, a very disgruntled public works director. Now, what choice do they have? They can look for another job. They can look to another community where all of these things are in place and say, you know what? I don't need to work for this city. I'm going to go work for that city. And I'll tell you folks, 10, 15 years ago, as a council member, you might have said, oh, so be it, we'll find another one. Boy, times have changed. <laughs> it is getting extremely difficult to find city administrators, city managers, city clerks, public works directors, water and sewer superintendent. I can give you story after story of cities out there that have these openings and have few, if any, applications. Um, they're, they're <laughs> the list is too long. Uh, Cascade recently had their city administrator leave. They got five applications. 
before they actually did the interviews, two of the five got other job offers and pulled out. And they interviewed the three, didn't find the right fit, the right person for the community. So they've been operating on interim city administrators and they're already on their second one. And so, uh, and also I can tell you that uh, there's some cities out there that have advertised for city clerk, have gotten maybe one, two applications. Uh, and so the days are long since gone where, where you would say, I don't care what the staff says. I don't care what they think. Okay, we're going to do it this way. You got to look upon this as a partnership where you reach out and work with these folks because they are a key part of making the city successful and, and going forward. You need a systematic review of all the policies that you've implemented. And that requires a periodic feedback from the staff. It also requires maybe you hear from your citizens from time to time. How is it that things are working out the, the decisions we've made in the past? Now, this can be done through reports from your staff and memos, might even be in a newsletter where you talk about, you know, uh, this particular policy was adopted and so far this is a result. I can give you a good example. Um, some cities uh, take it upon themselves to have a more aggressive nuisance abatement program. And, um, you know, the league has done a great job of putting together a nuisance abatement uh, a white paper or description of how to do it. They also do a workshop every year on nuisance abatement. In fact, I think that their annual nuisance abatement workshop is coming up here in the not too distant future. If you look on the league's website, you'll see the date and time. But by doing like a newsletter or a staff report, you can look back and say, you know, we adopted this nuisance abatement program about a year ago. And so far we have, you know, seen these properties cleaned up and this this nuisance taken care of, and these are the results of what we've done. Now, occasionally you're gonna run across a policy or something that has been laid out that needs to be revised. Uh, and there's, there's occasionally a need for amendments. What I tell people is be flexible because if you embark upon some new strategy or new project, there's probably gonna be some tweaks and bugs that you need to work out of it. So be open to that. and and. Uh, and it's a critical role of the staff to bring back to the council then how these policies are impacting the community and the city and whether or not they can be revised or in, improved upon anyway. And the other message I will give to council members um, who maybe, may, let's say nuisance abatement was your pet topic. You got elected because you wanted to clean up the town. That was your whole goal. And maybe, you've adopted a policy and maybe there's some parts of it that just is not working. Don't shoot the messenger. If the staff comes back and says, you know, this part of it's working, but this part of it's not working and we're gonna to need to modify it in some way. So uh, as I say, don't shoot the messenger of bad news. Hear what they've got to say and be willing to make the amendments. Because if you shoot the messenger of bad news, what happens? They're not gonna ever bring another a critical suggestion to the council table ever again. They're going to say, oh, I, I, I'm not going down that road. I'm not going to point out to them that this isn't working because that's not what they want to hear. So you got to make sure that your staff is open, that they can bring to you critical evaluations of things when it needs to be mended or changed, and that you are not going to uh, hold it against them when they do that. Now, ultimately, the council has the final say. So if there's amendments that are suggested, that's fine. You can say, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna stay the course, but at least hear them out. And if you decide to stay the course, explain to them the, the reasoning why you're not gonna make those amendments. Because if you don't do those two things, your staff is just gonna clam up and they're not gonna tell you anything. They're gonna just be very quiet. So, but the bottom line on all of this is be flexible. Okay. If you're a council member, you got to put some time and effort into this. Okay, <laughs> this is a, this isn't a job where you show up every two weeks for a, an hour and a half council meeting. It involves a little bit more than that, and uh, and hopefully you recognize that when you when you took the office. The number one thing is I think you need to allocate the time for a good goal setting session. Now this can be done on an annual basis. It can be done on a biannual basis. But I think it's important that you take the time to reflect back on 
I, I usually, when I do them, I usually have five things I, I tell them to look at. Number one, I want them to look at all the good things that have taken place over the last couple of years, because a lot of good stuff has taken place. Number two, what are the issues and concerns going forward? Number three, what are those policies and procedures that need to be accomplished and prioritized? Number four is all the capital projects that need to get done and prioritized. And lastly, how is it we're working as a team? Are there things we could do better to work together to have a good team effort? Um, or a lot of team, a lot of people call it a team building exercise. Another good thing to do is have work sessions where you maybe take one topic and you really go into depth on that topic and understand it, ask a lot of good questions. Uh, what I've found is that a lot of councils, let's say you meet on the, let's say you meet on the second and fourth Monday of every, every month. So the second and fourth Monday, that's your regular council meeting. But maybe on the first or the fourth or the third Monday of the month, you set aside as a work session where you go into a great deal of depth and discussion on, on a particular project or, or program that you wouldn't normally take the time to do at a regular council meeting. So I think, um, I think most council members that have done the work sessions have found them to be productive. Another good thing, of course, is doing um, community relations, and that's interacting with your citizens, the other agencies that you're dealing with, so that you can uh, have a good, good understanding as to what their expectations are as from the city uh, in the community. And lastly, I can talk a little bit about this earlier, and that is the capital improvements plan. Um, some of the cities that I know have done these in the past, little town of Palo near Cedar Rapids, I mentioned, I just did one in Cresco. Piasta has done a capital improvements plan, uh, Urbana, and I'm pretty sure Dubuque, I'm sure Dubuque has a very extensive capital improvements plan. So, uh, and by the way, if you want it, um, you just send me an email. I have a handout on capital improvements planning and how it, uh, I put together my top 10 reasons why you need to do a capital improvements plan. But then I also, as a supplement to that, I put together how to do a capital improvements plan. So it kind of takes you through step by step in the process of putting together a capital improvements plan. And so you're welcome. If you would ever like to see that handout, just send me an email and I'll forward that on to you. But I find that most larger cities out there, you know, the Clintons and, and, and the Dubuques and the Cedar Rapids of the world, uh, they probably have a capital improvements plan. But it's the smaller cities that many times have not taken the time to do a capital improvements plan. And they kind of go from project to project or <laughs> the, the term I like to use, they, they grease the wheel that squeaks the loudest where they say, oh, this is a, this is a project we got to get done. And, uh, and uh, we can't put it off any longer, which in the overall scheme of things, maybe it is. But when you put all the projects on the table at the same time, and look at the value of each project and determine how you're going to pay for them and what impact they're going to have on the city finances, that project may not be the one that is the most important. But because it got all this publicity and all this uh, input from citizens, you greased the wheel that squeaked the loudest. And maybe there was something else more important that you totally overlooked. Number eight, you need to have good, clear rules of procedure at council meetings. Um, one of the handouts that I've given you, uh, that I can provide to you is, is a rules and procedures handout. Uh, you need to look that over and uh, you need to formally adopt those rules and procedures. Because if your council meetings are kind of <laughs> all, over the, all over the place and, and don't present a good public image to the community and, and to the people in the audience, you probably need something that says, these are the rules and procedures that we're going to use because our goal is to conduct business in an orderly and disciplined and productive manner. Because if your council meetings are not run in this orderly, disciplined and productive um, manner, you, you look silly to the, the outside world, really. I, I, and I have been to these meetings where you like, you just kind of shake your head and walk out the door and say, seriously, <laughs> that's how they conduct business here? And, and I was, I tell people one of the reasons that it's so important is because this, these council meetings, it's the image to the outside world that uh, people have of your community. And, uh, and I know a lot of council members now videotape your, your meetings and I can go to a lot of city websites now 
and it might be painful to watch, but you can download these videos and watch them. And that's the image that now people have of your community if they sit down and watch one of your council meetings. So I always tell council members, what kind of image do we want to present to the rest of the world? And it's also critical that you avoid political partisanship in council meetings. And um, one of the articles that I gave you was a handout that I ran across from the uh, International City Management Association on how critical it is that you avoid political partner partisanship at council meetings. So, uh, because if that starts to come into the, to the picture, wow, things will really get uh, complicated and really get uh, less than enjoyable to be a part of. Number nine is to seek the assessment of the public and make sure you understand what their concerns are and then see how they're evaluating your performance as a city. Now, there's any number of different ways that I've seen cities do this. Uh, occasionally you'll see cities will do uh, a citywide survey or they might do, you know, call it a questionnaire. Uh, there's many times when you're legally obligated to do public hearings. You have to do a public hearing on the budget. You have to do a public hearing anytime you say, change the zoning ordinance. If you're gonna do a uh, TIF district, like an urban renewal plan, or if you're gonna do tax abatement and do an urban revitalization plan, you have to have a public hearing. Now, if you're like most cities, few if anyone shows up at these public hearings, but you're legally required to do it. Um, the other thing that you can do is have information on your city website. And I, I suspect most all of you watching today have a website. That is a great tool to get information out to the public on what your city is doing and, and maybe provide a little information about projects, programs. You know, I go back to that nuisance abatement program. If you're one of those cities that's taking a, a more concerted effort to uh, improve nuisance abatement, that would be great to take some of that information from the League of Cities and basically tell the public, this is why we're doing this. You know, we want our property values to stay stable. We don't want this community to go into a decline because I can tell you, if you don't get serious about nuisance abatement, it's a downward spiral, which will then result in the appearance of your community just you know, going downhill. And then after that comes declining property values. And then pretty soon nobody wants to live in your community. So provide the reasoning, provide the, the, the thought process that went into whatever program it is that you're trying to promote. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to put that information on your website. Now, I'm of the generation that says, I don't like social media, okay? A lot of the younger generation, they absolutely love it, okay? And, you know, I appreciate that, but I don't choose to be out there, okay? Uh, my, my wife does it, but I'm, I don't touch it because I think it has the potential to really do some harm as well. And uh, social media, it probably is a whole other topic that you can get into. But if you do use social media in your city, I just say, be careful, <laughs> be careful because it's, if you're doing it and you better keep tabs on it and you better be any, uh, any information that's put out there that's wrong or incorrect or false, you better address it immediately or it starts flying. So, um, the other thing that I recommend that you do is, uh, is you, uh, on all your projects that you're doing, is you put together an action plan on how you're gonna get the project done. And then you let the public kind of know, okay, this is the project and here's how we're gonna get it done. And here's the timeline that we hope to follow. So if you do that and keep the public informed. Now, one of the things that I've, I've heard the city of Dubuque does that I absolutely love, and that is when they do a street project, they actually go to the area where the street's being done. And they, you know, if there's a public building in the, in the area that they can use, then they have like an open house where they explain the project. If there's no public building, I've been told that they'll actually find somebody in the community and say, can we open up your garage <laughs> and invite people in to look at the plans and specs for this particular project? So before the first shovel of dirt is, is moved, they have had, these, these information meetings with the public to explain to them what the project is all about. Those are the kinds of things that I think is important that you do. Uh, another 
key thing is if you've got, say, a very important bond issue coming up into the future, most of the time you have pretty good advance warning that you're going to need this bond issue to do this project. One of the comments I heard from another city administrator is when that, when you have a bond issue coming up, you want to be talking about it two or three years in advance. And you want to be talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. So when the time comes to go to the voters and get their approval, the voter says, oh, yes, we've been talking about this forever. I can't believe they haven't done it already. Let's get it done and move forward with it. So don't just spring things on the public. You need to give them time to understand it and you need to give them time to uh, adjust to it and, and comprehend it. Getting into our last one, uh, habit number 10, and that I feel like I'm preaching to the choir on habit number 10, okay? You wouldn't be listening today if this wasn't important to you, okay? So I get that. Uh, but this is kind of my, my wrap up uh, habit number 10, and that is continuous learning and continuously uh, enhancing your skills and abilities to do this job of being a mayor, being a council member, being a county official, or city manager, city administrator, you know, city clerk. Um, there's a couple jobs that the, we have in city government where it's mandated. Your water and wastewater folks have to get continuing education and they have to be certified. And you, you gotta send them to workshops and conferences to stay up to date, to maintain their, their certifications as a, as a grade one, two, three, or four grade operator for water and wastewater. Your city clerks also have a certification program. Now it's not legally mandated by the Code of Iowa, but it is looked upon that if you're serious about being a city clerk, then you're going to go to workshops. For example, next week is the Iowa Municipal Finance Officers Association where your city clerks and your city financers, officers and your city administrators will have the opportunity to learn what's going on in city government that they need to be aware of so they can come back to you as a council mayor and say, you know, this is changing at the state level. We need to be prepared for it. So it's critical that you invest in the cost of sending your folks to these training sessions so they have a better understanding of what's happening in the future. Because if they don't go to these sessions and attend some of these things that the league puts out, they're gonna fall behind. And there's things that are gonna happen that they're not gonna be aware of. And one of the worst things you wanna do in city government is have some major thing that kind of falls through the cracks that you weren't aware of, that now suddenly you gotta deal with. But there's great opportunities for council members too. The Municipal Leadership Academy, which just wrapped up, uh, is a three-part session for newly elected mayors and councils. I hope those of you who are, um, had the opportunity to, to attend those sessions uh, because it's a great opportunity to learn what it is to, to be a, a policy leader or mayor and council in your community. But in, in September, I think it's the last week in September, the Iowa League of Cities has their annual workshop. And for those of us in Eastern Iowa, it's not that far away. It's gonna be in Waterloo this year. So if you've never attended an annual conference, highly recommend that you do, do so because it's a great opportunity to, uh, to talk with fellow council members and fellow mayors and other communities, but they have wonderful workshops that I think um, that you would get a lot out of. The other thing is, if you're in a mayor council, you're probably getting the monthly publication from the Iowa League of Cities. It's called the Cityscape Magazine. I've written articles in there over the years. A lot of people provide articles to the league. Uh, another good thing to do is get their daily updates from the league. Um, they're really covering the, the Iowa legislature right now. So you can sign up and get all of those updates. And another key thing is to network with other cities. You know, one of the great things about city government is you're not in this alone, okay? There's probably another city that's experiencing the same thing you're experiencing. Or there's probably a city out there that had that same issue or problem. And it's pretty, maybe I've already figured out a way to resolve it. So by networking with other cities, you find out what they're doing, how they're doing it, and now your city can learn from those folks. And this happens at conferences. For example, your city clerk hopefully is going to the Iowa Municipal, Poli Iowa Municipal Finance Officers meeting next week in Des Moines, and he or she will have the opportunity to interact with other city clerks. And I have seen so many side conversations that take place where the clerk will say, 
you know, we've got this issue we're dealing with in our community and we're not sure how to handle it. And someone else says, you know what? We handled that six months ago and this is what we did. Or they may say to them, you know, we've got the same problem, but I understand this community to address the issue a year ago. And this is what they did. So this is where you get the ideas to come back to your council with to help them resolve any issues or concerns that you're trying to do. So bottom line here is the time and effort that you put into staff training and education is, is critical. And um, it's part of everyone's job, mayor, council, and staff. And if it's any part of the job that you don't understand or you need some help on, there's all kinds of folks out there willing to help. Uh, the Iowa League of Cities is an excellent resource uh, for information. If you haven't been to the Iowa League of Cities website, highly recommend that you do that. It's, um, well, I think it's uh, iowaleague.org, I think is what it is. But one of the great things you can do is go to that website and look under resources, okay? And under resources, you're going to see a long list of things that have been written to help cities. Um, just one example, if you go under resources and go to uh, publications, if you're having issues in your fire department or concerns about what's going on in the fire department. There's a very in-depth publication that was written years ago on fire departments that you might find of interest. So, but it, it covers just about every topic that you can, that you can imagine. Okay, that is the 10 habits. Let's, uh, one of the things I wanna do before we wrap it up here and see if there's any questions, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the handouts that I provided, okay? And so if you haven't downloaded those handouts, that's fine. Uh, there's no problem there, but it, I always, when I do workshops like this, I like to take the topic and then give you a, you know, a lot of a, additional information that you can look at at your leisure. And so the first thing I put together is just a summary of this, this topic, this, this program. So if you have people that you thought, gee, I wish they could have seen this presentation. Um, you've got the summary of it uh, right there that you can share with them. Now, obviously it's not the same as hearing me preach at you for, for over an hour, but it, uh, it does give them the background. The other thing is I wrote the article for the Iowa League of Cities uh, on this very topic. Uh, that's something else you can share with them. Um, I, earlier, I mentioned to you about the, the importance maybe of a good code of conduct. And I did provide to you the article that I wrote on, uh, on a code of conduct uh, for you to look at. Also, I ran across a publication a number of years ago on a, conducting a, an effective city council meeting or just any meeting in general. And it talks about the 15 steps that you need to do to have a productive meeting because there's nothing worse than to go to a meeting and at the end of the meeting say, that was a total waste of my time. And I'm sure we've all been to meetings where we walked out the door and said, why did I bother? Total waste of my time. And so to have an effective meeting, there's, a, there's some things that need to be done both before and after the meeting. So I thought it was a good one page handout. The other thing that I gave you was some things that I did download from the Iowa League of Cities website. As I mentioned, it's a great website with good information. One is entitled City or Council Teamwork and Effectiveness. <clears throat> that was updated in October of last year. Uh, another one is uh, uh, that I've run across is an effective working relationship with boards, because you work with a lot of boards and commissions in both city and county level. So it talks about the importance of working with boards and commissions. Um, another good ar article I ran across on the league's website was something called Effective Elected Officials. Covers a lot of the things that I talked about today. Uh, and maybe goes into a little bit more detail. And the other one I ran across, um, which is uh, great for council members just coming on to, the, to their new role, and that's newly elected council members. And this one goes into quite a bit of depth about what to do that first nine, 30 days on the job, the first 60 days on the job, then the first 90 days on the job. Now, obviously, if you took office in January, we, we've blown right through this, but doesn't mean you can't take this and say, you know what, I didn't do that, but maybe I need to do that here in the next uh, 30 or 60 days. So uh, once again, a good handout for someone who is new to the role of being a council member. And uh, another thing I've, that I mentioned earlier was keeping partisanship, political partisanship 
out of local government. And that's the uh, article that I ran across at the ICMA that I think is worthwhile looking at if, if that's an issue in your community. And last but not least is a little one page summary that I put together uh, for councils on what I have seen some cities do to communicate to the public, to the citizens, what their goals and objectives are. And so um, eight different things that I've seen some communities do. Obviously, you're not going to do all of them. If this was written for kind of a follow up to goal setting where you, you, you lay out your goals and objectives. And now it's important for you to let the public know what it is we're going to be doing in this community and um, and how we're going to be spending your money. Okay. So that's, that's the last handout that I have there for you. So uh, that kind of does a quick overview of all the handouts. Um, do we have any questions? Okay. Questions in there? Let's see if there's one. It says, I have always felt that one can choose things. <laughs> I've always felt that one can change things, but not people. That's true. <laughs> you, uh, the, old, the old saying uh, that I use when councils, uh, people call me, I say, is, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. <laughs> all you can do is lay out all these ideas and options for them. Whether they choose to do them, that's up to them. As I've gotten older, I've learned more to accept that. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you have that difficult council member, um, you know, you're gonna have to probably put up with that person till the next election. Uh, if they're really get out of order, you can do that public censor thing I talked about. But yeah, that's that's a good observation. Uh, if you're a staff member, obviously, if it's so bad, your only choice is to look for a new job. And, uh, and I, occasionally I get calls from city clerks and city administrators that say to me, this is, this is not workable and it's beyond repair. In which case I say, then you need to look for a new job. So I hate to say that, but sometimes that's the case. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we're all here. So anybody have any more questions? If not, um, thank you, Pat. And right. thank you, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, please uh, be looking for the, I'll be sending out an email probably early next week with the link to this um, training recording, as well as the last two that Pat has done for all those who registered for those. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, again, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining and thank you, Pat. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye everyone.